Hi, I'm just checking if we're unmuted. Can you hear us? Yep, we can hear you. Come out, I think. I want it to start and I get start. The same one this week. Do I have to go out and try to get it? Go out and we'll try it again. connected with the audio so I mean I just have to ask. What are you doing here? Uh, I'm trying to get my icons to come up back on the bottom. Oh. Hello? There, that was right. Yeah. 
Hello. We can hear you, Dave. Okay. Thank you. Hello, is that you, David? Hello? We can hear you, Dave. All right, then I'm in the right place. I, I always worry about being in the wrong place.
Good evening and welcome to the Stearns County Board of Adjustments public hearing for Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I have a couple announcements to make. Uh, just for your information that all testimony will be recorded for the record. So when you are going to speak, please um, state your name and your address for the record first, and then you can go ahead with your testimony as soon as you are recognized by the chairperson. In response to the COVID-19 and pursuant to Minnesota State Statute Chapter 12 relating to emergency management, Governor Walz has declared a state of emergency. In response to the state of emergency and in accordance with Minnesota Statute Chapter 13D.021, the Board of Adjustments members and the applicant may participate by telephone or other electronic means. The meeting will be broadcast live. Um, for the citizens to watch. Okay, members of the Board of Adjustment are appointed by the County Board of Commissioners with one member 
from each of the each of the five commissioner districts, one member at large and one member appointed from the planning commission. I'll give a brief overview of our proceedings this evening. I will first read the variance request and that will open the public hearing. When I finished reading the request, I will ask the applicant um, or their representative um, just to be on hand uh, for us. And then I will ask the environmental staff to provide a brief overview of the requested variance, um, staff report and report on any correspondence that's been given regarding the request. The applicant and or the representative um, can then provide input, corrections, concerns, comments that they might have. Once the applicant or the representative um, have finished with their testimony, um, the board will discuss the request and ask questions of staff or the applicant. Upon completion of the board questions, then I will ask if there's anyone in the audience wishing to speak to um, this request. And if there is, that person um, can um, speak to us via the web broad broadcast or by telephone. When the testimony is completed, I'll ask board members for a motion to close the public hearing. Once the public hearing has been closed, um, there will be no more further input from the audience, from the applicant or staff, unless recognized by the chair or if the board members want some type of clarification. Our first item this evening is to consider a request from Edward Ward, St. Cloud, Minnesota, from sections 10.2.11A1A of the Stearns County Land Use and Zoning Ordinance 439 to place a new single family residential dwelling unit less than 100 feet landward of the OHWL of a lake classified <coughs> as recreational development. The said ordinance requires structures to be placed in a minimum I'm of silly. 100. <laughs> um, could members please be on mute? Thank you. Um, the said ordinance requires structures to be placed a minimum of 100 feet landward of the ordinary high water level of lakes classified as recreational development. The affected property is part one of, of lot one of Sunnyside Edition, Section 29, Track 125 North, Range 30 West, Avon Township. The property address is 17731 Upper Spunk Lake Road, Avon, Minnesota. And I believe um, Edward Ward, um, is he with us in one of the meeting rooms? Yes, I am. All right, we'll be back to you in just a couple minutes. First thing I will do is check with um, board members as to how many of them were able to um, visit the site. Dennis? Yes. Jill? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I also visited the site. So if staff could please give us their report. Good evening, Madam, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, Mr. Ward purchased the 4,953 square foot tract in 1999, and that lot size is per the certificate of survey that he submitted with his app. There was an existing uh, stick-built cabin on a concrete slab which was constructed in 1963, and that's per our county assessor's records. That structure has been removed from the property, and all that remains now is, is the slab. Uh, a 2,000 gallon holding tank was permitted and installed in 1999. That was certified in July of 2020 and compliant. The applicant now is proposing to place a 260 square foot RV on the existing slab to replace that stick built cabin. The slab is 23 feet landward of the ordinary high water level. The applicant does or did obtain a township variance from Avon Township to place the RV no closer to the road than the existing concrete slab. The slab is approximately 27 feet from the center line of Upper Spunk Lake Road. Uh, the lot coverage 
On the certificate of survey was 17.9% and this proposal will not increase the, the lot coverage percentage. This property is in an R1 zoning district and in the shoreland overlay of Big Spunk, which is a recreational development lake. It's not in floodplain. Big Spunk is on the list of impaired waters for mercury and fish. The holding tank, as I stated, was certified compliant in July. Avon Township, the Department of Natural Resources, City of Avon, Avon Area Lakes Association, and property owners within 500 feet have been notified of the request. I do not have any correspondence for this item, Madam Chair, so you can take it away. Okay, thank you. And our applicant, Mr. Ward, um, if you could share with us um, your thoughts, please. Okay, can you hear me okay? We sure can. All right. Uh, two years ago, the cabin became infested with a black mold that I was warned could damage my lungs. I had about $7,000 spent renovating the cabin, including a new roof and so on. Uh, the mold came back this year. And given the condition of the cabin, plus the mold infestation, I decided to have the cabin demolished. There was no way I was gonna be able to use it after the, the attempted renovation and so on. And so what I did was had it demolished. Again, it was unusable. And what I'm wanting to do is on the slab is place a travel trailer. And I know it says here something about well, so it made it sound like I was going to put a permanent house there. It's a travel trailer. It's half the size in terms of square footage of the cabin. It will be farther away both from the lake itself and from the center of the road uh, than the cabin was. I intend to use it approximately two weekends a month during the uh, spring, summer, and fall, just a weekend getaway type of place. Um, is this the time at which I can address the staff analysis points four through seven? It's on the second page of what I received, the Board of Adjustment staff report. Okay. Yes, if you have some additional comments, please go ahead and make them. Okay. Um, on point number four, it says the property owner proposes to use the property in a reasonable manner. That's what I mean by going up there a couple weekends a month. It's going to be very recreational for me. Uh, number five said the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property, not created by the landowner. As you've all been there, you realize that it simply is not that far back from the lake itself till you get to the road. It's an um, almost narrow strip of land, quite frankly. Uh, it, so that's the lot size. Number six says the variance, if granted, will not alter the essential character of the locality. And within parentheses, this says, is this request similar to what others have, similar sized or number of structures adjacent or in the area? Before I go to number seven, the photo that was sent, the nice full page color photo, uh, that shows not only the slab, but it also shows what is just south of this lot. And that is what I would call a travel trailer. There are four travel trailers in a row. Uh, just, uh, I'm calling it south, uh, just south of where I live, and I would just be putting on something very much like that one. That's, it'd be the fifth one, quite frankly. Then going back to point number seven for just a moment, uh, the need for the variance involves more than economic considerations. Uh, there, there's not really an economic consideration here. I simply have a cabin that had to be torn down due to mold infestation. Um, I'm wanting to replace it with something that is actually considerably smaller. It's about 55%, I think, of the square footage of what the cabin was. And then going to uh, number three there, and pardon me, going to number three toward the back of the paperwork I received. The pages aren't numbered. That's why I'm not doing what I'd like to here, it, where it says Avon Township Variance Decision, which open the page, that's where that color photograph is. Um, I like the idea that was proposed here that says, currently the runoff from the property goes directly to Upper Spunk Lake with minimal buffer and continuous slope to the lake. 
That's absolutely true. Uh, it never occurred to me that that was a problem because in the 21 years that I've owned this lot, I've uh, never put on any insecticide, herbicide, fertilizer, anything along those lines. I do like the idea where it says options for mitigation about a, a native plant buffer and so on. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I have every intention of doing that. Uh, if you needed to inspect to make sure it was done, uh, depends on how long the winter lasts, but I would say by May 15th, you could take a look there and make sure I did that. Um, what And what else it comes down to is uh, if I don't get the variance, then, then really there's not much I can do with this lake. I just want to put a travel trailer on it like my four neighbors down the street have. Uh, I believe that's all I need to say. Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, if we have additional questions, we will get back to you. Are there um, board members that have questions for either the applicant or for staff? I would make a motion to close the public hearing. Dennis Gregory. Okay, we have a motion. A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is anyone opposed to closing the public hearing? Hearing none, um, the public hearing is now closed and we will move on to findings of fact. Um, the variance request is to place a new single family residential dwelling unit less than 100 feet landward of the ordinary high water level of a lake classified as recreational development. Question number one, the proposed use is allowed in the zoning district in which the subject property is located, yes or no? Madam Chair, Mike Kane, uh, the zoning is R1 and it's residential structure going on the property. Uh, we have a yes for number one. Does anyone disagree with yes for number one? All right, moving on to question number two. The variance will be in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the official controls and any related ordinances, yes or no? Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, I think it is in harmony with the general purposes, uh, which is uh, water uh, quality protection. Uh, and the applicant has indicated a desire to put a plant buffer in. Uh, and also, he's not disturbing any soil in this uh, particular request. Uh, so I think it is in harmony. All right, we have a yes for number two. Does anyone disagree with yes? Hearing none, we'll mark that as unanimous, yes. Number three, the variance will be consistent with the comprehensive plan, yes or no. Madam, Madam Chair, Chair. Jill DeLong. Go ahead, Jill. Um, under living and lakeshore living policies, number six, expand mitigation requirements for projects requesting to vary from lake setbacks to preserve the riparian environment and reduce erosion to enhance water quality. Um, as uh, Member Gregory stated, uh, the concrete slab already exists, and as the applicant stated, he's um, interested in adding the lakeshore buffer. So I believe that yes, it is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Okay, we have a yes for number three. Does anyone disagree with that? We'll mark that unanimous yes. Number four, the property owner proposes to use the property in a reasonable manner, yes or no. Madam Chair, Mike Kane, I believe it's reasonable to want to use your lake shore uh, property every couple of weeks in the summer. All right, we have a yes for number four. Does anyone disagree with that? Hearing none, I'll mark that as unanimous, yes. Number five, the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property, not created by the landowner. Yes or no? Madam Chair, Madam Dennis, go, go ahead. ahead, Dennis. Sorry. Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, um, I think it is a uh, circumstance unique to the property because of the lot size, as the applicant mentioned. All right, we have a yes for number five. Does anyone disagree with that? Hearing none, mark that as unanimous yes. 
Number six, the variance if granted maintains the essential character of the locality, yes or no? Madam Chair, Jill DeLong, um, as the applicant stated, the next door neighbor has an RV on the property. I believe that <clears throat> adding a seasonal RV to this property will not change the character. All right, we have a yes for number six. Does anyone disagree with that? Then we'll have a unanimous yes. Number seven, the need for the variance involves more than economic considerations. Madam Chair, uh, economics weren't discussed as a part of this application. All right, we have a yes for number seven. Does anyone disagree with that? I'll mark that as unanimous yes. We are now ready for a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, I would move that we approve the applicant's request uh, to place an eight by 32 and a half uh, foot recreational vehicle uh, as a residential dwelling unit, 23 feet the ordinary high water level. And with the condition uh, that uh, he implements uh, the recommendation as put forth by Greg Berg. All right, do we have a second to that motion? <clears throat> Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn, uh, I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. We will roll call for the remaining members. Jill? Yes. Dave? Yes. Um, oh, I missed Mike? Yes. Jake? Yes. And I also am a yes. So that is a unanimous vote. And your motion carries. Um, and Mr. Ward, if you have any additional questions in regard to your application, you can check with staff via the telephone during regular business hours. Okay, um, thank each of you for your time and please drive carefully. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Our next item on our agenda for this evening is to consider a request from Alan and Mary Laska, <laughs> Sox Center, Minnesota, from sections 10.2.8A1 of the Stearns County Land Use and Zoning Ordinance 439 to convert an existing single family residential dwelling unit to a duplex on a lot not meeting the width or area dimension, dimensional standards for lots within the Shoreland Overlay District of Lakes classified as natural environment. The said ordinance requires a minimum lot width of 300 feet and a minimum lot area of 120,000 square feet for lots within the shoreland overlay district of lakes classified as natural environment. The affected property is lot three less the north 32 feet thereof of Randy's addition section 19 track 123 north range 30 west of Wakefield Township. The property address is 22406 Fordham Road, Richmond, Minnesota. And I believe we have um, several people um, with us via the webcast. Um, Alan and Maria, Mar excuse me, Alan and Marilyn Latska, are you with us this evening? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. And also, I believe a Dave Meyer, attorney for the Latskas. Yes. All right. Thank you. And we will be back to you um, to hear your testimony in just a few minutes. I, the first item I would like to do is to check with um, board members as to who was able to see the location. Um, and I believe many of us probably saw it the last time that it was um, up, but um, some of us may have returned to take a second look. Um, so, Dennis? Uh, yes, I did view the property and I also received a voicemail message from Marilyn uh, advocating. Uh, for their uh, for the approval of their request. Okay. Um, Jill. Yes, I did visit the site and I received a phone call from Ms. Latska also. Okay. Uh, Mike. Yes, I visited as well. Okay, um, Dave. Yes, I visited as well and also received a call. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jake. Yep. Okay, Sean. Yes. And I also visited um, the property and also received a phone call in regard um, to this matter from um, the owner. All right, um, staff, if you are ready to give us your report. 
The applicants own lot three, less than north 32 feet of block one Randy's addition, which was platted in 1978. The lot does not meet the single family uh, minimum area size requirements for lots in a shoreland overlay of a natural environment lake, but it does meet the width. Uh, the minimum requirements are 80,000 square feet in area and 200 feet in width. This lot is 76,266 square feet in area, and the lot width is an average of 247 feet. Uh, in August of 1999, the original owner of the property applied for a variance to construct a duplex and uh, a variance from a feedlot setback for the MIG farm on the east side of County Road 71. At the time of the variance app, the lot was 84,167 square feet in area, but it did not meet the minimums for duplex lots, which required 120,000 square feet. Uh, on the 26th of August in 99, that variance was denied. The owner then reapplied for a feedlot setback variance to construct a single family home, and that variance was granted on the 23rd of September in 99. Prior to applying for a construction site permit and a septic system permit for that dwelling that was allowed by variance, the previous owner then sold that north 32 feet of lot three block one to the uh, north neighbor. Again, this leaves the lot at approximately 76,266 square feet in area. The applicant uh, then applied for a permit, uh, construction and septic permit for a four bedroom, single family residential dwelling. And those permits were issued in March of 2000. In 2018, the property uh, was foreclosed. And then the applicants uh, acquired the property in November of 2019. And that deed was recorded in December of 2019. So what the applicants would like to do or are proposing is to make the current single family residential dwelling into a duplex dwelling unit. Uh, to our county assessor's records at this time, the structure has eight bedrooms and four bathrooms. The applicants applied for variance to convert that structure to a quad in March of 2020 and that variance was denied. So the minimum lot size for duplex lots that are in the shoreland overlay of a natural environment lake is 120,000 square feet in area and 300 feet in width. The existing septic system is sized for four bedrooms and that is compliant. So they have a compliant system. The property is located in R1 zoning. It is of course within the shoreland overlay of Ian Lake, which is natural environment and that is not on the impaired waters list. The current lot coverage is approximately 12%. Wakefield Township, the DNR, Sock River Chain of Lakes, Sock River Watershed, the City of Richmond, and property owners within 500 feet have been notified of the request. I did receive uh, eight letters of correspondence from the public uh, I believe the board is in possession of all of those, and they were all in opposition to the request. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, you can have it back. All right, thank you. Um, if the applicants and their represent their attorney um, would like to speak, I don't know who wants to speak first. Uh, Madam Chair, David Meyer, do that, please. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to visit with you tonight. The question we're posing to you is if it is a reasonable use for two families to use this very large existing building. There, there's no changes to the exterior of the building. The building exists as it is on the lot as it is. And the building interior would be reconfigured um, to re to assure the board and the county staff and so on that it would only be used for 
uh, two, two families. And that's what that's what is proposed. Um, I think staff gave you all the information that they can give you about it. Um, I, you know, going through your findings, which you'll be doing in a few minutes, um, it looks to me like, you know, the proposed use uh, is allowed in the district. They are, you, you do allow duplexes in this district. Uh, it is in harmony with the general purpose intent of the official controls. Again, you allow them duplexes and it is surrounded by existing housing, and, but a lot of businesses. Importantly, it fits your comprehensive plan and, and um, under goal four, uh, objective three, a major objective is to provide a diversity of housing opportunities for your for the residents of Stearns County. And goal six is more specific on that, a diversity of housing prices and styles um, to create opportunities around job centers. This is located in the Cold Spring Richmond area. Um, it's probably no secret they need housing for their workers. And this would provide housing for larger families um, with the bedrooms as has been told to you and the bathrooms. Uh, there's in addition two garage stalls, I understand for each, um, each side. Uh, the septic system fits, although Mr. Alaska is talking about maybe putting another one. Uh, in there, it would be a unique and betterment to the housing uh, goals out in that part of the county uh, for large families to have a rental unit. And this would be market-based rental units. Um, uh, the, you know, is the, your next question is the purpose, is the uh, use proposed reasonable Yes, it's, it's allowed under your ordinance. It doesn't fit for the reasons that have been cited, but it's there. You know, is the plight of the owner, or a plight, of the, prop, plight of, the, of the property due to the owner? No, they bought it, and you all know the history. You heard it, and I understand they were, Laskas were in asking for a fourplex, and that was turned down. I think you understand it. But they, I'm going to tell you, were innocent buyers, and purchased the property and now they're trying to put it to a reasonable use under, under your ordinance. Um, it will not alter the essential character of the locality because the building is already what's there. Uh, they're not proposing to change it. And finally, is the need for the variance uh, more than economic? Uh, it's a betterment of the use of the building and that's what it is. Could it be used for a single family? I suppose it would be awkward, be a lot of space, and it would be better for the community housing needs if it were allowed to be a duplex. Um, so under the zoning ordinance, as you all know, the question you have to consider is, is this a reasonable use for what's there? Um, you're away from the lake and so the you're in the shoreline impact zone, certainly, but you're not um, directly uh, putting anything more into the lake. Um, so, the property's there, the property exists, and all we're proposing to do is to allow two families who can work in the community to live at the property. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll take questions, and Mr. and Mrs. Lasker are also on the, on the line, too. All right, if um, there are questions from board members for either staff or for the applicant. Um, I have one question um, for staff. In our report, it indicates that the existing septic system is sized for four bedrooms, so therefore it's compliant, um, but this whole facility has eight bedrooms. Can you address that, please? Uh, Madam Chair, I the assessor's records show that it has eight bedrooms. Uh, staff was not aware that there's eight bedrooms in the structure. I don't know, maybe, maybe the Lotskas can uh, expound on that, but uh, the, the structure as stated in the report was permitted as a single family dwelling of four bedrooms. That's what the septic was sized for. Uh, that septic system was certified and it was compliant. Uh, the, the Lotskas have submitted 
a design for a new septic system. Uh, but staff is unaware that that there's more than four bedrooms in the structure. Um, Madam David Myers, uh, Mr. Laska does intend to put a new septic system in. Um, if, if there's a misunderstanding in the assessor's records, I will say it wasn't Laska's, but he, he does intend to put a new system in. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions from board members? Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, um, question for the applicants. Um, uh, and I know we covered this last time, but I don't remember the answer. Uh, when the real estate listing uh, was out there for this particular property, uh, what did it list it as? Did it list it as a single family residence or did it uh, list it as something other than that? I'll have to allow the last uh, just to answer. I, I'm, okay. This is Alan Latska. Um, I, I'm, I can't recall what it said exactly. Uh, I, I believe I, I didn't look at, I, I, I looked at it and saw what it was. I saw the layout and I, I just assumed it was a, a duplex. Uh, uh, I, I, guess I, I, it could have said single, uh, family dwelling and I was on a, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to that, see that. But I, I'm unsure. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Dennis, your this property is listed as a single family, one story, eight bedroom, four bathroom home. But it is single family listing. That, that was my recollection, um, but thank you for confirming. All right, thank you. Um, Additional questions? Yeah, the, you know, I, I don't know if, how relevant this question is. And so if it's not relevant, we'll pass. But I'm just curious if the applicants, um, you know, the purchase price that they paid, uh, a duplex is a lot more expensive than a single family residential dwelling. Uh, and I know it was in foreclosure, so that may have impacted. Uh, but, you know, when they purchased it, did they buy a duplex, pay for a duplex? Uh, or did they buy and pay for a single family residential dwelling? I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Lasko. I, I don't know what they paid for the property. Uh, I believe, uh, it, yeah, this is Alan Lasko. I mean, I believe uh, I, when I went in there, there was, there was uh, dead rodents laying on the floor. Uh, I paid for it. Flex. Uh, but, I mean, there was some holes in the walls and, and, uh, uh, there were damage to the property. So I believed that damaged duplex property. Latska, um, when, when we, um, there are 30 individuals living in that property that we had to get permission to look at each of the separate units. And we, we were under the impression that we were buying um, at least a, a building that we could make into at least three separate units because there was three separate individuals living there. Uh, now, whether they were related or not, we had no way of doing that, but we needed three separate people to look at those units. Yeah, and they were separate. And they were three separate units by three separate um, So here. And we, we paid uh, a, a good amount of money. We paid $200,000 for this one building. Um, and we have taken out separate loan because that um, because had any money coming in on this uh, loan and this right. property for a year now we have taken out a second loan already uh, payment and so we're now over two hundred thousand dollars in this whole in this project and still don't have anybody renting so um 
that's that's how far in debt we are already on the property. Thank you. And one final question, if I may. Um, the neighbors uh, or the property owners in the area have, uh, as uh, as Mr. Nett uh, indicated, have uh, written in opposition. Uh, they have a number of points, um, but one of them uh, I would appreciate if you would address, and that is, uh, how do you, uh, in a family-oriented residential uh, um, development, how do you ensure that the renters uh, in a duplex would maintain that essential character of that community? Well, I, I, um, oh. Go ahead, David. Madam Chair, th these are going to be market rate rents. They're not going to be subsidized rents or low end. And Alaska, as they've said, have put money into this property and like any landlord, they're going to want to make sure of a high end building that they that the tenants keep good care of it, uh, not have trouble in the neighborhood and, uh, you know, maintain themselves and and their families in a way that uh, doesn't disturb others. Um, like, like I said, like a high end rental that this is intended to be. This is Marilyn Latska. I just uh, we do, uh, I check um, credit scores, um, and we usually have quite a few applicants, and and we we weigh the credit scores, the uh, references, the have you ever before those kind of questions and then we take all that information and we weigh out our best applicants and those are the ones we rent to um they sign a one-year lease and in that lease um they are going to keep the inside uh neat and clean and tidy along with the outside of the building um and we do inspections on both the inside and if they are not compliant with their lease uh, then they um, are um, told that they're non-compliant with their lease, and then they are told to clean it up or a place to live. Thank you for that feedback. Okay, other questions or comments from board members? All right, hearing no additional comments, are we ready for um, to close the public hearing? Can I say one more thing quick? Sorry. Go ahead. From Wakefield Township uh, was in favor, and Wakefield Township was in favor of this. I, I, I don't believe anybody, any, anybody has mentioned that. She, this property, uh, and it has been for the last, you know, 10 years. That's my last comment. All right, thank Madam, you. Go ahead, Jill. Madam Chair, Jill DeLong. So just a question. Um, for the for staff or or the applicant too, if I mean this is a large building. It, it is. It's and it's only 20 years old. Um, it is a large lot. It is, it's not 80,000 square feet, but it's 95.4% um, of 80,000 square feet. Um, if, if we deny them, uh, what are they allowed to even do? Or would they have to tear down the whole building? I mean, it's, it's a good building. It's got good structure. It's in relatively good shape. It's, existing and it's been there for 20 years uh, what other options would they have if we say no i believe their option would be to use it as it was permitted for as a single residential dwelling madam chair 
Yes, go ahead. Another question for staff, Mike Hain. Um, the 80,000 square feet is for a single family, but if they intend to use it for a duplex, it's short quite a bit because it's a 120,000 square feet lot, correct? And the, the lot smaller, even for a single family versus even a duplex. Madam Chair, uh, that's accurate. It's a 120,000 square foot area for a duplex. It does not meet the dimensional standards for a single family for area, but does for width. Uh, I have a question for staff. Um, this is the chair. Uh, just so I can kind of get a feel for this. Um, can you give me a definition difference between a duplex and maybe a single family home where they rent out their basement? Someone else, you know, owner occupied and they rent out their basement. Um, how does the county look at that differently than a, than a duplex? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I'll have to grab my ordinance to see if we have a duplex definition, but uh, quite honestly, without a complaint basis, we we don't have a way of knowing if somebody's renting out their basement. I'll just be frank. Um, typically, how we discover those types of situations is, is when somebody files a complaint as to that activity. So, in other words, that would be something. Honey, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so, that would be something as far as the county is. is um, Concerned if somebody's renting out their business, they should have a rental permit. Um, okay, the county doesn't have rental permits. All right, thank you. I just wanted to know if there was a difference between that, if it were owner occupied, if that would make a difference in renting out the second unit. Madam Chair, I have a question for staff. Do they does the city of Richmond require? A rental license, or is there any inspections required for any of that, or is this just up to the owners to do their part in providing that? Uh, Matt, Madam Chair, Member Hain, uh, the city of Richmond does not have jurisdiction on this property because it's within the township of Wakefield, um, and you know, so therefore, I, I'm not certain what the city of Richmond's requirements are. But they don't, uh, because this property is not within the municipality, they don't have jurisdictions. Okay, thank you. Um, are, do we have other questions um, or are we ready to move to um, findings? Dave Gamron? Yes? I'd have a question for staff. If, if this was, uh, say a house that was uh, configured for several older people to live in or assisted living type of thing, could that be done in this area? Or is is that uh, subject to different rules? Uh, Madam Chair, Member Gamrat, uh, I don't believe that type of facility is allowed in the R1 zoning district. Um, it, it would be, it's a residential one zoning district and that that type of facility wouldn't would not be allowed in this okay. zone. Okay, th um, thank you. Um, are we ready for a motion? Move to close public hearing. Okay, and that was Mike. And do we yes. have a second? Jill DeLong, second. Okay, we have a motion to close and a second. Is anyone from the board opposed to closing the public hearing? Hearing none, um, the meeting, the open hearing is now closed and we will move on to findings. The proposed use is allowed in the zoning district in which the subject property is located. Yes or no?
Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, I do believe that duplexes are an allowed use in an R1 uh, district. All right, so we have a yes for number one. Does anyone um, disagree or have further comments for number one? Hearing none, I'll mark that as a unanimous yes. Number two, the variance will be in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the official controls and any related ordinances, yes or no. Madam Chair, Jill DeLong, question for staff. Go ahead. Um, so can I get a little bit of background on the, um, the origination of lot size in the Shoreland Overlay District of why for, uh, why the lot sizes are required to be that long for duplexes? Do we have some history on that? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. Member DeLong, um, those lot size standards were developed uh, under a model ordinance, one of the original ordinances. And so our zoning ordinance took effect in April of 2000, and those were standards that were basically adopted. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to get to understand. Um, so is the larger lot size in a shoreland overlay district is the, the goal of that to have more. Um, natural space or more grass space um, closer to the lake. Is that kind of the goal of that kind of an ordinance or is it um, something else? Um, Madam chair member DeLong. Uh, that's fair to say it it's within the overlay of uh, a natural environment lake. And so the intent is to have larger tracks and more open space and uh, therefore limiting the amount of development on that specific type of lake. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, question for the applicant. Go ahead. Um, what is the square footage of the building that's on the property? Do we know what that is? Alan Latska. Approximately, it's a little under 5,000 square feet. Um, the, the, if you were out on the property, I mean, there, there is a lot of room around the building and there is nothing gonna be added to the outside of the building. And like like we said earlier, the, the building is already in existence. We're not putting up a new building. So as far as. as okay, thank you. Madam Chair, <laughs> if I could interject, uh, Dave, Go Nett, ahead. Dave Nett with Environmental Services staff. Um, our assessor's records show the, the heated square feet of the structure at 4,301 square feet with a first floor area of 2,688 square feet. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are on number two. The variance will be in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the official controls and any related ordinances, yes or no. Madam Chair Jill DeLong, I believe that it is in harmony with the official controls. I believe the, that the official controls um, are to help limit um, the amount of buildings and density surrounding a natural lake like that. Um, it's This sounds like the building would be a large single family home if that's what it was going to be used for. It's on a lot size that um, is not the correct lot size for a duplex, but it is 95% of a lot size for a, 
a single family home. Um, so I believe that uh, by using the space that is already there and the building that is already there, um, I think that it would still be within um, in harmony with the official controls. All right, we have. We have a 1 yes for number 2. Um, does anyone else have comments they'd like to share or thoughts on number 2? Uh, Madam chair, Dennis Gregory, um, you know, while I appreciate uh, member DeLong's uh, thoughts uh, on the matter and, uh, and, and certainly I don't find this to be a black and white uh, issue. Uh, the lot after the. Uh, previous owner sold off part of the lot is 76,266 square feet. Uh, Mr. Nett uh, from the environmental services uh, indicated the purpose of the ordinance uh, to have 120,000 square feet. Uh, this is 63.6%. So uh, we're, we're not talking about something that's 90% or 80%. We're talking something at 63.6%, so it's just barely over half. Uh, and so, um, ultimately, again, I don't think it's a black and white issue, but um, I will uh, I will disagree. I, I don't think it is in harmony. All right, thank you. So we have one yes and one no for number two. Um, so therefore, we will do a roll call on this question. Um, we have a no for Dennis, a yes for Jill. Mike? No. Dave, uh, a question for staff. If this was not in a uh, lakeshore area, what are the what are the specifications for a duplex? How would it differ? Because this is not on the lake. It's because it's in the impact zone. All right. If and you just give them a moment, staff is um, looking that up in the manual, so that'll just take us a moment. Yep. Bear with me. Okay. Oh, yeah. So R one. Okay, Madam Chair. So the question again was duplex lot size yep. outside of Shoreland? Outside of Shoreland. So single family is 30,000 attached single family, I guess would be considered duplex. Um, it's 40,000 square feet with an approved sewage treatment system that has two dwelling units. Okay. And so, then and it's additional 10,000 for each additional dwelling unit. So for a duplex, it's going to be uh, 40,000 square feet with the approved sewage treatment system. Okay. So, so you know, what I'm getting at is this building is not on the lake or doesn't really have access to the lake, but it's in the shore impact zone and the shore impact zone uh has far reaching effects and if in this type of situation it, it really changes the the thing. I mean, you know, if that would be it would be plenty big uh, lot if that was not in the shore impact zone. And you know, for me, when I first looked at it I couldn't believe that I was in an impact you know, the lake. I didn't see the lake right away. So I, I think it would be in harmony with that reason because yeah. Uh, it's not within a hundred feet. It's not next to the lake. I can see next to the lake is one thing, and you know that far away from the lake. Is and just one clarification that it wouldn't be in a shore impact zone, but a shore overlay zone. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep. Um, so we'll continue. We have a no from Dennis, a yes from Jill, a no from Mike. Um, Dave, are you ready to um, yes. make a vote here? I'll say yes. Jake? No. Sean? Yes. And I am a no. Um, I believe um, it, it isn't right on the lake, but yet we have guidelines and our guidelines call this a, a shore impact or a shore overlay zone. And so I think we need to be respectful of that. Um, so I am a no. So we have on this question, we have four no's, three yeses. On question number three, the variance will be a be consistent with the comprehensive plan, yes or no? Madam Chair Jill DeLong, um, I believe yes under living, living goals number three to support housing options that give people in all life stages and of all economic means viable choices for safe, stable, and affordable homes. I believe this is a very large building. It would make for a very comfortable, you know, if it's 43,000 or 4,300 square feet. That's over 2,000 square feet per unit. That's a really good size home. That's bigger than my house. So um, I think that having uh, it split as a duplex would make it um, would be consistent with a comprehensive plan. Uh, we have one yes for number three. Do we have additional um, comments? All right, then um, is there anyone that disagrees with yes for number three? All right, hearing none, I will mark that as unanimous yes. Um, number four, the property owner proposes to use the property in a reasonable manner, yes or no? Madam Chair, Jill DeLong, um, the property that they purchased was a building that um, by all eyes looked like a fourplex. Um, it is large. It is constructed to be that way, whether or not that's what it was sold or or licensed as. I believe that uh, using this large property um, in as a duplex is a reasonable manner. It is very easily split that way. It was built that way. Um, I believe it is a reasonable manner. All right, we have one yes for number four. Is there additional um, comments? Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, um, the real estate listing uh, listed this property as a single family residential dwelling. Uh, the purchase price uh, would indicate uh, for a uh, 4,000 foot house, uh, that would be a single family uh, dwelling price in my view. I'm not an expert, but in my view. Uh, and so I think the reasonable manner uh, is the manner it was intended uh, as a single family home. Despite the previous property owners uh, going around the ordinance uh, and uh, you know not being turned in, uh, that doesn't uh, you know uh, all of a sudden uh, wash the property of of, of the issue. And so uh, I don't think it is a reasonable matter. It is meant to be a single family residential um, you know home um, that was unfortunately built out in a different manner. All right, we have one yes and one no um, for number four. So therefore we will do a roll call. Um, Dennis is no, Jill is yes. Mike? Yes. Okay. Um, Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I am going to be a no. So we have five yeses and four no's. Number five, the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property, not created by the landowner. Uh, Madam, I would okay, say go ahead, Dave. 
it's unique to the property because the property was built that way. It's not something that this landowner has done. So I would say it would be unique to the property. All right, we have a no um, for number five. Are there other um, comments? Madam Chair, I believe he was a yes. Oh, excuse me, a yes. Sorry about that. So Dave is a yes. Um, other comments or questions? Okay, then um, do we have anyone that disagrees with yes for number five? Um, I just have one question from staff um, for staff um, in previous training sessions that I've gone to. Um, we were told that when th for this particular question. Um, when it says landowner, that it doesn't specifically mean current landowner. Am I correct with that? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so that when it says landowner, it could be prior landowner. Um, and so because of that interpretation of this question, um, if it includes prior landowners, well, it would be the plight of the landowner because they chose to build um, a structure that's designed to be a, a duplex or a fourplex when they were permitted a single family dwelling. So I am going to be a no on this one. Um, so we have so far we have one no and one yes. And so we will do a roll call on this. So number five, um, Dennis. No. Um, Jill. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to vote for a yes because we've had numerous rulings just while I've been on the board where uh, we voted yes on this one when it was the previous owners that did the deed, including one on Monday as well. So I am a yes. Mike. I agree with Jill. Yes. Okay. Um, Jake. Yes. Um, Sean. Yes. All right. So for this question, we have um, five yeses and two noes. Um, number six. The variance, if granted, um, maintains the essential character of the locality. Madam Chair, Jill DeLong, um, this building has been multi-unit occupied for the last 20 years. Uh, the building itself is staying there. Um, I don't believe it will change the essential character of the locality. So I'm going to say, yes, it maintains it. All right, we have one yes for number six. Um, Madam, any other Ma comments? Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, um, the previous multi-unit use uh, per testimony at the last uh, meeting uh, was by a single family uh, related to individuals, not unrelated individuals. Uh, and so uh, the rest of the area is a single family uh, and residential area. Um, and. Uh, and so I do think it changes the essential character of locality. All right, we have a no from Dennis and a yes from Jill. We'll do a roll call on the remainder. Um, Mike? No. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I am a no. Um, so we have four yeses and three noes. Number seven, the need for the variance involves more than economic considerations. Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, um, the applicants and uh, whether they would have uh, said it or not uh, are looking for rental revenue. And so this is a significant economic issue to them. Uh, to get this uh, variance. And so uh, I do think uh, that the main reason for the variance request is economic considerations. So you would be a. Um, this one? Okay. Yes. Um, yes I am a no. <laughs> okay. So we have one no. Um, is there other 
comments or? Madam Chair, Jill DeLong, um, I believe that using a building as it currently is built and designed uh, where it was built and designed to house more than one family, um, I believe that it, it could be considered wasteful to not use it as such and to try to redesign it in a into a different way. Um, it, it makes sense to use a building as it was designed for its purpose. So I believe that it does involve more than economic considerations, although I do agree economic considerations are part of it. All right, so we have one no from Dennis and a yes from Jill. So we will do a roll call for the remainder. Um, no. Um, Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I am a no. Um, so we have four yeses and three noes on number seven. Uh, we are ready for a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, I move that we uh, decline the applicants a request for a variance to convert an existing uh, convert an existing single family residential dwelling to a duplex on a lot uh, that does not meet the width or area dimensional standards. All right, we have a motion to deny. Is there a second? Madam Chair, Mike Ain, I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion by Dennis, a second by Mike, and I'll do a roll call on the remainder. Jill? No. Um, Dave. Uh, we'll come back to Dave. Um, Jake. No. Sean. No. I am a yes. Um, Dave. No. Madam Chair, we have a, uh, a situation that doesn't work. Um, we have uh, an answer to one of the questions that was uh, in the majority no. Uh, and so the motion has to go the same way. Okay, and um, let's, do we then readdress question number two, staff? All right, um, we can look at question number two. Um, right now, our answers to question number two, we have four no's and three yeses. So number two was answered in the, ne in the majority of the negative, and therefore we cannot, um, by our guidelines, um, approve this. Do we have additional discussion? Madam Chair, wouldn't that have to be addressed to the people who voted against uh, or no on number two? Yeah, I believe it so. Wouldn't be uh, uh, to ask them uh, to reconsider at this point. All right, we'd have to go back to question number two. Um, the variance will be in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the official controls. Um, we have a vote of four no's. And three yeses. Um, we would need to have someone that would like to change their their vote at this time. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, just a point of order. Uh, anyone could change their vote. Uh, somebody that's, who voted yes. That's correct. Vote. That's correct. Um, so, yeah. um, if we want to have discussion on number two again, and then we'll do a roll call vote on number Maybe two. Madam Chair, maybe remind us of who voted which way on that All first. Right. On number two, we have a no from Dennis, a yes from Jill, a no from Mike, a no from myself, a yes from Dave, a no from Jake, and a yes from Sean. I'm willing to switch my vote. Jake? Ma Madam Chair, if, if I may make a comment or two. Yes, go ahead. 
Um, so, you know, the, the crucial part of this question, I think a number of the other questions in this is uh, who, who made what decision and, uh, and who was the innocent party here? Uh, and so I think it's important, um, however we vote, I obviously will support uh, what the board does. Um, but I, I think there's a number of comments that have been made throughout uh, this process uh, that these uh, individuals have inherited a terrible issue uh, that they're trying to resolve. Um, they didn't really inherit any issue. They, uh, they decided to buy a, a home. Uh, it was listed as a single family home. Um, certainly when they went there, there was uh, other occupants, um, but they really should have asked a lot more questions at that time. So I don't, th I don't think we have, quote, an innocent party here uh, that was just kind of thrown in. And uh, I think we always have to be careful uh, about uh, kind of trying to read between the lines uh, of what their intentions were and what situation they're in. Uh, there are reasons for, uh, you know, this ordinance. And uh, so, again, I'll support uh, whatever the board decides, but uh, I would hate to see one member change their vote simply just so that we can get in alignment. And, and I'm going to agree with you, Dennis, on that. Um, the applicants indicated that they've had rental property in the past or currently other properties. And so probably are well aware of um, how rental properties are permitted and, um, you know, I guess me personally, if I were going to buy a unit like this, I'd be going and checking at from the permitting agency to find out, you know, that it, it all met standards. Um, um, maybe the best thing we need to do is for number two, um, Um, let's, we can have read back from the record um, what the comments were on number two and then um, do a roll call vote again. I believe just to be fair to everyone's. Um, so are we able to read back um, comments that were made, the, the reasons for yes and no's on number two? Um, that might take just a moment. The staff is pulling that up. Um, Matt, there, Dave Gamrad. Yes, yes, Dave. Uh, my comment would be is I think that sometimes the shore impact zones are uh, probably a little excessive and they affect property that you wouldn't think is in a shore impact zone because my farm is affected by two impact zones and one doesn't have any open water on it. So, okay. I'm I think that sometimes these rules were written and, uh, you know, we're set to say, was it reasonable for this case? And I think in this case, probably, uh, there's no runoff that goes towards the lake. You can't see the lake from this property. And I'm thinking that in this place, we're, we're not just judging, uh, a lake shore. We're judging something else. That's my comment. Okay, um, if staff, were there additional comments that you could? If, Madam Chair, uh, what I have is Jill was a yes, and her comments were that it was in harmony with the purposes and intent of the official controls. Uh, and because the limit density in the natural environment lake district and Dennis was opposed or a no, uh, he felt it was not in harmony because of the insufficient lot size. The lot size did not meet the requirements. All right, um, I think we will do a- Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I, Go ahead, I would have to ask that the point that Dave Gamrot made during that vote in that discussion now about the lot size and if it had been in a different place was a very important point. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like I'd like to also add one comment to this. Um, I believe you know when we look at the rest of the neighborhood there, um, I think the expectation of the rest of pe the people in that neighborhood 
um, when they either bought or moved in there was that this was a single family residential area because that's what it was, you know, that's what it is zoned as. Um, so that's why I am voting. I was voting no on number two um, because of that. And also um, the buyer beware on when you're purchasing property to make sure that you can use it for what you want to buy it for, that you actually can use it for that. Um, any other comments before we do another roll call on, on number two? All right, I'll do another roll call for question number two. Um, Dennis? No. Jill? Yes. Mike? No. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I am a no. All right, we are ready for a motion. Madam Chair, I'll leave uh, someone else make that motion. Okay. Madam Chair, Jill DeLong. Um, I move that we approve the variance to convert an existing single family residential dwelling unit to a duplex on a lot not meeting the width or area dimensional standards for duplex lots within the Shoreland Overlay District of Lakes classified natural environment. Okay. Um we have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn, I'll second that motion. All right, we'll do a roll call on the remainder. Dennis? No. Mike? No. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. And I am a no. So the motion carries. Yes, just a moment. And Sean was a yet. Yeah. He, yeah, Sean seconded the motion as a yet. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes, I did. Okay. So we are um, four yeses and three noes. So motion carries. Right, if you have any additional questions um, about your request, um, you can talk with staff during during um, regular business hours. And thank you. Madam Chair and board members, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Okay, our next item on the agenda is to consider a request from Thomas and Alice Ross of Foley, Minnesota from sections 6.5 of the Stearns County Subsurface Sewage Treatment Ordinance 422 to convert a standard tank and drain field septic system to holding tanks to serve a single family residential dwelling unit. The said ordinance requires a standard type one or type three system be installed unless um, site limitations as documented and sketched by a licensed designer will not allow for the installation of a type one or type three system in concurrence with the department. The affected property is lots nine and 10 of Ross Edition, and the front point eight one acres of government lot three, section nine, track 124 North range 30 West of Collegeville Township. On the property address is 16428 Laurel Road, St. Joe, Minnesota. And um, applicants, are you with us this evening? Yes, um, I am speaking on behalf of my parents, Tom and Alice. I am Barry Ross. All right, we will be back to you in just a couple minutes. Okay, um, could we do a roll call as far as who is able to visit the site? Um, Dennis? Uh, yes, and uh, there was a neighbor there, uh, Ken Harmon, I believe his name was, who, who uh, basically described the property in the area. All right, thank you. Um, Jill? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. And Sean? Yes. 
and I was also um, at the property. Um, if staff could give us an overview of this request. Uh, applicants uh, purchased the property in May of 1994. Uh, it sounds like uh, Mr. Ross is uh, challenging that date of purchase. That's what we have on our recorded deed. Uh, it's lots nine and 10 of Ross edition, which was platted in 1951. And it's uh, 0.18 acres on a non repairing government lot, which is across the road from Ross edition. The existing residential dwelling unit is two bedrooms, and that was constructed in 1971 per our county assessor's records. And of course, that was prior to any official controls. The uh, septic system that serves the dwelling, there is no permit record on it. Uh, it was inspected on September 4th of 2020, and it was determined that the drain fill uh, was not compliant because of lack of separation to the water tape. The 1,000 gallon tank that serves the dwelling is compliant. Again, the construction date of the system is unknown, but uh, um, we do have some documentation that was provided by the applicants um, around the year 1998 or 1999. Uh, there is uh, some documentation of the system being there, although it's not known when it was constructed. A licensed designer did explore a suitable site for a type one or three system across the road on the government lot. But it was his opinion because of the, uh, the high water table and surface water issues that holding tanks are the best wastewater solution for this site. Uh, there's two neighboring dwellings to the south of this property that do share a mound system on part of that government lot that's across the road. Uh, the applicants um, in decision with their licensed designer would like to reuse the existing 1,000 gallon tank that was compliant and then add an additional 1,500 gallon tank and just use those as holding tanks. Uh, the property is, uh, uh, to my knowledge, is proposed to be sold. Uh, this property is an R1 zone district and within the shoreland overlay of Big Wattab Lake, which is a recreational development lake. It is on the list of impaired waters for mercury and fish. Uh, Collegeville Township, Big Watt Tablet Association, the DNR and owners within 500 feet have been notified. I do have one letter of correspondence. It's from a Scott Newman, no given address. Uh, received on Wednesday, October 21st. Dear board members, I'm writing you this email in full support of the proposal to install a holding tank. I believe, uh, believe that if the drain field would be installed on the property, it would have the potential to get into the lake via the creek adjacent to the property. The land where the drain field would need to be installed is very low and floods after heavy rain and all of that water drains into the creek. With the drain field only 25 to 75 feet from the creek and the flooding, I believe a sealed tank would be the best way to protect the lake. Thank you, Scott Newman. Uh, I have nothing further, Madam Chair. Okay, we can hear from the um, applicant's representative, Mr. Ross, and we also have um, the septic designer on the line. Um, for his comments and questions to him. So, Mr. Ross, if you could go ahead. Yeah, so Scott Newman, he actually, if you look at that, that uh, aerial site map, he actually is two properties to the north of us. So that's where he resides. Um, but I'd also like to go back to the background information and just to clarify, um, uh, again, the, the addition was plotted back in 51 by my father's father, um, uh, Frank Ross. And uh, my per parents purchased that back in 1967. Now, it may not be recorded, but um, you know that was the recollection of my parents. Uh, I remember growing up on that lake, you know, when I was a three-year-old. So um, uh, we've been on that lake forever. Um, one other thing, uh, uh, as far as the background information, is there there was the septic system as is was originally installed in 1971. 
Um, the additional information that we have around the 98, 99 timeframe was when Big Watab Lake Association uh, hired a company to come around and check all uh, uh, systems for to become in compliance with um, Big Watab's uh, goal of becoming uh, or continuing to become a clean lake. So again, the reason that I'm here is my parents are selling the cabin, they're 83, 84, they're too old to continue to maintain it. Um, uh, I am un unable to uh, afford to buy it. And so we are actually looking at selling the property. We do have a niece, um, so it will be staying in the family that is looking at purchasing it as a uh, summer lake home. So it's more of a seasonal type uh, use situation. Um, the uh, original septic, the tank was fine, but the, the, the drain field failed because of uh, the separation. The area that our property is listed in is a very low lying area. And if you go back to 51, when the additional um, uh, addition was created, further south, there's a huge hill and they, they, they plowed a lot of dirt down into this area in order to make room for these lots because it was so marl based and it was a very um, mucky type soil. Um, uh, and where all of the homes are is where all this dirt was placed. Uh, behind our place, it's it's the lowest area within this area here. And so what happens is when it rains heavy uh, behind the, the shed there, which is a potential proposed spot, we get a lot of flooding anytime you get a heavy rain. Um, and then um, that's that that creek that's there is a, is a, I don't know if it's not a 100% a perennial creek, but uh, it runs most years. Uh, some years it does freeze up depending on uh, how cold it gets. Uh, and when that happens, my battery's running low here. Um, hold on. Oh, maybe that's somebody else's. <laughs> Good. Um, so sometimes uh, in the spring, uh, it floods that entire back area as well. So the proposed site where the septic might be uh, floods on a consistent basis. And the last thing we want is that water running into the creek and then back into the lake. So the proposed plan is to add a 1500 gallon um, additional holding tank uh, to limit the amount of uh, time that the pump trucks have to come in and, and uh, uh, pump the tanks out. So um, it is a kind of a unique situation because where our property is, it's very low lying. It's um, and where the tank or the a potential uh, drain field would be. It's it's just uh, and it's not based on my opinion. The the compliance, the certified compliance inspector through Stearns County recommended that we go to more of a holding tank application because of the potential placement of where the drain field would be. Uh, we would also, if if indeed that would be the case, it would need to be an oversized um, uh, system, which he would think would be closer to 50 to 80. Uh, in size rather than more of like 30, 35 to 60. So it's almost twice the square footage that would be required because of the the of the the low lying uh, swampy area that it the only spot that would be available. So um, let's see here. Uh, we are also uh, 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 putting in a brand new well. It'll be a drilled well. Um, Trout will be coming out um, where the old tank was. Uh, we were required to get a new well, so that well will be uh, uh, a drilled cased well uh, to make sure that there's no issues there as well. So, okay, and Mr. Ross, we do have um, Keith, the septic designer, on the line. If you would like him to um, address us as well, yeah, Keith can can uh, you know give his a personal opinion on why he recommended that. So, all right, um, Keith, are you there? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Barry said it very well and explained the situation of that uh, lot. Um, behind the garage is the best spot if the soil uh, would be okay, but the soil is not that great for it. It'd have to be a type three. And like he explained, there's a creek on the south edge of that property. If that's going to flood and or if it ponds back there behind the garage, it's 
not a good idea. What if there's running water there at times and that can erode it and bring it into the lake and we don't want none of that to happen. So and having an additional tank for holding tanks um, for these lots that have situations or setbacks and or soil, then that's why we're here doing a variance and the holding tank I think is a better solution for this address. Bonnie, you're muted. Thank you. Do we have any questions for either the um, applicant or the designer um, from board members at this time? Um, um, <laughs> Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, and a uh, question for staff. Uh, if, uh, if we do approve a variance, uh, do they need a pumping maintenance agreement or does that automatically happen with a, uh, with a tank? Uh, Madam Chair, Member Gregory, if they were allowed or granted a variance to go to a holding tank, a um, maintenance contract would be a requirement of the permit. Okay. Thank you. All right, other questions for staff, the applicant, or the designer? Okay, hearing none, um, are we ready for a um, motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. We have a motion from Mike and a second from? Dennis. Dennis, all right. Um, anyone opposed to closing the public hearing? Hearing none, um, we'll move on to findings. Uh, the variance request is to is to convert a standard tank and drain field septic system to holding tanks to serve a single family um, residential dwelling unit. Um, number one, the proposed use is allowed in the zoning district in which the subject property is located, yes or no? Madam Chair, Dave Cameron, they are allowed holding tanks out in the R1 zoning district. All right, we have a yes for number one. Um, does anyone have additional comments? Is there anyone that disagrees with yes for number one? Hearing none, we'll mark that as a unanimous yes. Number two, the variance will be in harmony with the general purposes and intent, intent of the official controls or any related ordinances, yes or no? Madam Chair, Mike Kane, um, I believe uh, the primary reason for this holding tank is to preserve the water quality in the area uh, around the lake. So I believe that is in harmony with our uh, comprehensive plan. All right, we have a yes for number two. Any additional comments? Is anyone opposed to yes for number two? I'll mark that as unanimous yes. Next three. The variance will be consistent with the comprehensive plan, yes or no. Madam, Madam Chair, Chair, Jill DeLong. Go ahead, Jill. Nature underwater resource policies number five, to recognize the carrying capacity of groundwater and surface water in development and land use decisions. Um, as the, the applicant stated, um, the land there is very low lying. It wouldn't make sense to have a drain field. And so um, a tank is a better solution. All right, we have, um, is there any additional comments for number three? All right, we have a yes. Is there anyone opposed to yes for number three? I'll mark that as unanimous yes. Number four, the property owner proposes to use the property in a reasonable manner, yes or no? Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, yes, a reasonable manner uh, given the uh, subsurface in that area, uh, holding tank is the best option. All right, we have a yes for number four. Any additional comments? Anyone opposed to yes for four? Hearing none, I'll mark that as unanimous yes. Number five, the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property, not created by the landowner. Madam Chair, Mike Kane, I believe the soil's condition and the, just a relatively close to the, the creek is what's causing this decision to be made. All right, any additional comments for number five? 
we have a yes. Does anyone disagree with yes for five? Mark that as unanimous. Um, the variance, if granted, maintains the essential character of the locality, yes or no? Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, this variance will not uh, impact the essential character. Any other comments? We have a yes for number six. Anyone opposed to yes? All right. We'll mark that as unanimous. Yes. Number seven, the need for the variance involves more than economic considerations. Yes or no? Madam Chair, Blackburn, um, it certainly involves more than economic uh, considerations. They're taking an awful lot of into account of how they want to preserve the, the water and make sure it doesn't get contaminated and, uh, and they're taking uh, positive steps. Okay, um, any other comments? We have a yes for number seven. Anyone opposed to yes? Hearing none, I'll mark that as unanimous yes. Uh, we are ready for a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, I'll move that we approve the applicant's request for a variance to convert a standard tank and drain field septic system to holding tanks uh, to serve their single family residential dwelling. All right, we have a motion. Um, Madam to Chair, Mike Kane, second. And we have a second by Mike. Um, I will do roll call. Jill? Yes. Um, Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I also am a yes. Um, so the motion carries. Um, if you have additional questions about your, um, your procedures for putting in your holding tanks, um, you can contact um, staff via the telephone during regular business hours. And thank you for joining us this evening. All right, our next item is to consider an after the fact request from John and Christy Held, Cold Spring, Minnesota, from sections 10.2.11b2a of the Stearns County Land Use and Zoning Ordinance 439 to leave us constructed a water oriented accessory structure that exceeds 10 feet in height and occupies an area greater than 100 square feet, excuse me, 150 square feet. The said ordinance specifies a water oriented accessory structure shall not exceed 10 feet in height and, and cannot occupy an area greater than 150 square feet. The affected property is lot 4, block 1 of Sunset View, plot 2, section 2, or section 28, um, track 124 North, range 30 west of Collegeville Township. The property address is 27059. Hidden Cove Road, Cold Spring, Minnesota. And is the applicant with us? Uh, yes, I am. John Held. All right. We will be back with you in just a few minutes, Mr. Held. Um, Thank you. We'll do a roll call on who was able to visit the site. Dennis? Yes. Bill? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I also visited the site. All right, um, staff, if you could give us an overview of this request. Applicants currently own lot four, block one of Sunset View, plat two, which was platted in 2002. Uh, property is located in R1 zoning district. The property is approximately 40. 1,584 square feet in area, uh, which they purchased in 2013. There is an existing dwelling with attached garage that was permitted and built in 2013. There's also a residential accessory that was permitted and constructed in 2016. In 1979, a previous owner created a walking slash running path on the properties currently known as Sunset View Plat 2. On this particular property, there's a 216 square foot bridge that was constructed over a low uh, drainage way. The bridge remains as is and will remain as is. Uh, the applicants have removed a six by six or 
36 square foot platform since a previous request that was made in August. And the applicants are requesting to leave as constructed the 11 by 13 and a half foot shed with the foundation. Um, and it's 12 feet, eight inches in overall building height. An additional 28 square feet of platform is attached to the bridge and the landing around the shed. Uh, the property is within the shoreline overlay of Big Fish Lake, which is a recreational development lake. It is on the impaired waters list for mercury and fish. The existing sub septic system uh, was installed in 2014 and was certified compliant this past July. The lot coverage prior to the project was approximately 23.7 and the proposed would be 24.6 when complete. Uh, Collegeville Township, the DNR, the Sock River Watershed District, the Big Fish Lake Association, and all those property owners within 500 feet have been notified. I do not have any correspondence, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And if we could then hear from the applicant, and if you can share with us, you know, how the situation has changed um, since your your initial request um, a month or so ago, a month or two ago. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, since uh, since we met last, I have uh, made numerous calls to the uh, Stearns County Environmental Services. I've uh, talked to Jamie Lucas in detail on two occasions. Uh, we've had a few email correspondence, and Jamie's also come out and done a site inspection, and we've looked at some of the details. Um, I would like a couple quick clarifications. Um, we do talk about the bridge. I would like to clarify that I believe that the bridge is more than just a bridge. Um, it's the only place on the uh, property when we bought it, including an empty lot next to us that had a place to sit. I think the bridge was to have access on the trail, but I think the bridge was also a primary sitting area, uh, patio type of area, and we certainly are anxious to be able to continue to utilize that structure as it was intended to be used. Uh, since we met last, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I need to also clarify that when we met last time, the blueprint I gave you had a, a significant error on the blueprint. Um, I had what I consider the uh, platform for the shed attachment um, placed six feet too far uh, to the uh, north on the property. Um, in so much that meant that it did not line up with the existing bridge in its original position, uh, which meant there was a lot of extra square footage um, of platform, which really did not exist. Um, with clarification from the county, um, we looked at what I was allowed to do and what I wasn't allowed to do. Um, it was determined that um, I am allowed to have a 32 or up to 32 foot a landing area off the shed, which is considered uh, section D. Um, section B is the platform, which includes the 148 and a half square foot shed. That platform is slightly wider than the shed. Um, it was wider than that previously. On the north side of platform B, I had uh, approximately up to a foot over um, extra ledge on it, which I have removed. On the east side, I've removed additional uh, platforming and off to the south, I also removed uh, additional platforming. There is currently on the um, south side of the platform B, um, I have about a three inch lip that extends past the shed. On the uh, east side of the platform of B, I have an approximately eight inch lip. Those two extra lips, I would like to be able to consider it reasonable for the use of my property. It's in a um, sloped area. Um, we are planning on doing landscaping down, down that area with uh, boulders. Um, I don't have a good area to put my ladders and uh, general things I need for maintenance. We are using uh, a pine type of uh, uh, structure in that area. It's gonna require staining and caulking every three years. And I would be coming off that with a horizontal plank that I would put onto that lip to allow me access to do some maintenance. 
Um, there, it's a pretty narrow strip, so I'm hoping that would be considered reasonable. Um, on the picture you're showing right now, that uh, rough area of the grass or the rough area of the dirt um, used to have a, an additional uh, platform on it that I have removed. Um, that was, a, I think, an additional 100 square feet of platforming that I have removed. Um, also, in the perimeter of the original bridge, I had add a, added a trim board, which increased the surface area by some square footage. That's also all been removed. Um, at this point, the structure from the lake side is 10 feet or greater from the lake. It is only, it's slight, is shorter than 150 square foot in uh, size. Uh, the interior dimension of that shed is no greater than what would be allowed if I had that shed placed anywhere else on the uh, property. Um, the overall height of the shed is 10 feet or less based on the uh, shoreline berm and the bridge area. Um, I'm asking for an extra two feet, eight inches for the pylons to be able to set that bridge or that shed above a low lying area that has drainage because I don't want to put the shed down in that drainage. I believe my alternatives to what I did would include getting a minor shoreline alteration and bringing anywhere from 10 to 100 cubic yards of dirt in. I could do that and bring that into the same area that the shed is in and develop a, a, a large level area to put the shed on. Um, the dimensions and position of the shed would not change. I'm hopeful that I would not have to do that um, because of the, the, the wear and tear would be on my land. Um, we had a minor shoreline alteration permit uh, uh, back at uh, fall of 2018. Uh, spring of 2019, we did the alteration as, as we were described. Um, we have taken two full seasons just to get our yard almost back up to shape. If I was to have to do that, another minor shoreline alteration and bring that in, I would have heavy traffic over a drain field. I would also de really destroy my lawn. It would probably take another two seasons to get my lawn back up to what I would like to see it at. So I'm hoping that the position of the shed and the height do meet the requirements based on the visibility from the shoreline. Um, it does not exceed the heights based on the shoreline. The position is somewhat unique. I do have an extra 28 square feet. Um, if you would please go to the one dot site plan, uh, the updated site plan that's got the different letters on it uh, with the areas. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in A, that is the A is the original uh, bridge that existed when we purchased the property. Um, B is the platform that we've added. It has the 148 and a half square foot shed on it. It's got the additional square footage for the two lips on the edges for maintenance. C is a, the beginning of a additional sidewalk or raised, plat, raised walkway that we are going to be needing because we're going to be adding a second stairway down to the lake for a pontoon when we purchase that. Um, it is allowed to be four feet wide, which it is. So that's where C comes in. Uh, D is considered a landing off the shed. I'm allowed 32 square feet. Um, that is where D comes in. Um, the position of D allows me to have a little extra width. The initial platform of A had an 18 foot long bench on it. It's the only place in the property that did have a view of the lake and it's the only part of the property that did have any sitting area to enjoy the lake. Um, we are we wanted that little extra width and that was a good place for the landing because we want to continue to have an area to sit and enjoy the lake and also have a free area to walk to the shed itself. The shed does have a door that swings outward, which does limit um, our ability to have a seating area. So we would like to continue to use the bridge slash patio sitting area. And it uh, um, is 28 square feet, which is over the allowable square footage that I that we are allowed to have. Um, that could be removed and then there would be a landscape area in that. I don't think it would look right and I think it would be a trip hazard and um, the shed placed on a flat area would have a flat area there and we'd have to make it flat with some type of landscaping. Um, to remedy that situation, I have removed a six by six section of the original bridge from the uh, south portion of the bridge. 
Um, I am hoping that that would be the way that I could um, just not justify, but to keep the intended purpose and size of what we had in the in the added on um, structure in compliance with with the overall goals of the of the project and the um, and the property itself. Um, Jamie did come out and we did talk about this. I did voice some concerns to him about the fact that if I was granted, if if the uh, Board of Adjustment did feel that my additional height was warranted due to the topography of my land, um, but did not agree with the additional square footage of E that I would fail the variance again, um, I asked him how we could we could just how we could go about that. He said that we could possibly have two separate votes, one on the height of the uh, the structure, and also a second vote on the additional square footage for E. Um, I will defer to the the board if that is reasonable or if they would like to vote one single vote. I'm just hopeful that if the height is reasonable and the extra square footage is not reasonable, that I would have the chance to work with the count of the county to remedy the extra square footage, the extra 28 square foot on section E and the extra approximately 18 square feet of lip around B for maintenance. Okay, thank you for your uh, your information on, on how things have changed. Uh, thank you. Board members, um, if do you have questions for staff or for the applicant at this time? Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, it would be helpful uh, to have staff uh, go through the same site plan that's up on the screen. Um, I get uh, that A is the original uh, structure. I think I'm fine with that understanding. Uh, and I get that B is 18 feet over the 150 foot water accessory structure. Uh, I'm not as familiar with D, the 32 feet that's allowed. So I would appreciate comments on that. And if C is allowed a four foot walkway, uh, why is it only allowed that length? Uh, if, if you could comment mainly on D and C, I would appreciate it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Gregory, is that for me to comment or for the county to comment? Uh, for or the both? county, thank you. Okay, the thank county. you. Thanks. Madam Chair, Member Gregory, uh, my understanding is that D is allowed landing area coming out of the shed. So he's allowed 32 square feet, which he's showing there. Uh, and C is a four foot wide stairway. The length I think is is merely the applicant's uh, personal choice in terms of the, the length of the stairway. The four foot is a dimensional standard that's allowed by ordinance for a stairway. Yeah, and so I'm familiar with that ordinance at four feet. Um, let me go back to D for a second. So 32 feet is in the ordinance. That is the, and, and that's just an arbitrary number, 32 feet, and, but it, that's what's in the ordinance. That's in the ordinance, 32 okay. square feet allowable for a landing. Got it. And so if the applicant wanted to move C from being uh, four feet long uh, and and since it's only two and three eighths inch, or is it the four feet long that that you're saying is is uh, because walkways we typically talk about four feet wide, and and they can be quote as long as they want to be, um, and so could C go all the way to the shed if you know wouldn't, wouldn't that be wouldn't the ordinance allow that? Uh, Madam Chair, Member Gregory, the ordinance would allow a stairway four feet in width and no specific length is is uh, prescribed by ordinance. It's 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 merely a width requirement that it can't exceed four feet in width. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions um, for the applicant or staff? Um, hearing none, are we ready to close the public hearing? Is there a motion? So moved, Dennis. 
right? We have a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second, Mike Hain. Okay. And is anyone opposed to closing the public hearing? Hearing none, the public hearing is now closed. Uh, we will look at the after the fact findings. Um, number one. Is the proposed use allowed in the zoning district in which the subject property is located? Oh, just me, I'm, I'm, gonna stop, I'm gonna stop here just a minute. Um, first of all, we should decide whether we want to do the 10 foot height separate from the 100 and um, greater than 150 feet, um, exceeding the 150 feet, or if we want to do them as one. What would um, board members prefer? Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, I would prefer to do one vote. On both items, all right. Mike, and I'll, I'll also say one vote. And I would as well. Anyone else? I would as well. Okay, we do have majority there, so we'll go ahead with um, doing one findings of fact to leave as constructed a water orientated accessory structure that exceeds the ten foot in height and occupies an area greater than the hundred and fifty square feet. All right, so question number one, is the proposed use allowed in the zoning district in which the subject property is located? Madam Chair, Mike Kane, it's R1 zone and uh, water oriented accessory structures are allowed use in that zoning district. All right, so we have a yes from Mike. Any other comments? Anyone opposed to yes for number one? I will mark that as unanimous. Yes. Number 2 in the variant is the variance in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the official controls. Madam Chair Jill DeLong, I believe that the intent of the controls are to limit um, construction of non-permeable structures near the water. Um, and I believe that this is limiting it. It is making it smaller. It's fitting it closer to what our requirements are. So I believe it is within the official controls. All right, we have one yes for number two. Um, any additional comments? Anyone opposed to yes for number two? We'll mark that as unanimous yes. Number three, is the variance request consistent with a comprehensive plan? Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn. 
Uh, when we look at the uh, comprehensive plan goals and objectives in the living section, and we look at our lakeshore living policies, there's a couple that uh, can be taken into account in this discussion. Um, uh, number two, to encourage shoreline protection and restoration methods. Um, number three, to discourage the alteration of natural shorelands and creation of impervious surface. In some ways, it sounds like it's against this, but we also are looking at the fact that he's uh, making compromises. He's asking for the variance for um, for preservation reasons. He doesn't want to have to deal with a wall or a shoreland alteration or anything like that. He wants to be able to use his property. So I think it kind of it falls into that with a, a yes on the lakeshore living policy. Yes, and I would agree with that in order to make it come into compliance. It sounds like he would need to do. You know, a lot of work, move a lot of um, ground. And um, that could be very detrimental to the natural um, setting there. So we have a yes for number 3. Does anyone disagree with yes for number 3? We'll mark that as unanimous. Yes. Number four, is the property owner proposing to use the property in a reasonable manner not permitted by official controls? Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn, uh, it, again, it certainly seems reasonable. He's trying to make use of an old structure uh, without having to take it down and, and he wants to be able to use his property and uh, it seems like reasonable to me. All right, we have a yes for number four. Any additional comments? Anyone opposed to yes for number four? We will mark that as unanimous yes. Number five, is the plight of the landowner due to circumstances unique to the property not created by the landowner? Madam Chair, Mike Hain, I do believe the topography of the land with the lower ravine area that that is in and the, and the bridge are specifically unique to that property. All right, we have a yes for number five. Any additional comments? Anyone opposed to yes for number five? We'll mark that as unanimous yes. Number six, will the variants maintain the essential character of the locality? <laughs> Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn. Um, I, I, it certainly will maintain the character. It's been that way for a long time with some of these unique features on those waterways around there. Uh, it's a it's a nice area. All right, we have any additional comments? We have yes for number six. Anyone opposed to yes for number six? All right, number seven. The need for the variance involves more than economic considerations. Yes or no? Madam Chair, Mike Hain, I don't believe economics are really discussed as a considering factor. Um, any additional comments? We have a yes for number seven. Anyone opposed to yes? I'll mark that as unanimous yes, and we are ready for a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, I make a motion that we approve the applicant's request for an after the fact variance to leave as constructed a water oriented uh, accessory structure uh, that's 12 feet 8 inches in height and 46 square feet larger than allowed. And there is a condition. Let me see here. Uh, no, that's if it's denied uh, with uh, with no conditions. All right, we have a motion to approve. Is there a Madam, second? Madam Chair, Mike Hain, I'll second that. All right, we have a second by Mike. I'll do roll call. Jill? Yes. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I am also a yes. All right, motion carries. If you have any additional questions, you can contact staff. Um, via telephone during regular business hours. Thank you very um, thank much you. for your consideration. Okay. Thanks for coming it. this evening. All right, our last item on the agenda for tonight is to consider a request from Nick and Rebecca Dixon 
Fridley, Minnesota, from sections 10.1.8E1 of Stearns County Land Use and Zoning Ordinance 439 to develop a proposed two lot plot having vehicular access lower than two feet below the regulatory flood protection elevation. The said ordinance requires the proposed subdivision have a vehicular access at or above an elevation not more than two feet below the regulatory flood protection elevation. The affected property is 5.13 acres of the west 400 feet of government lot one, less the east six feet lying south of of the north 280 feet. Section six, track 121 north, range 27 west of Linden Township. The property address is 1223 Basswood Road, South Haven, Minnesota. And um, I believe this evening we have, let's see, um, Rebecca Dickinson, the owner, are you there? Um, actually, this is Jennifer McCullough. I'm one of the, the buyers. buyers of the property, okay. correct. Okay, is Rebecca with us this evening? The sellers are not on the call. Okay, then I'll take them off my list. Um, then is Rhonda Shermer? With us this evening? Yes, she is. Yes, okay. I am. All right. And then um, Realtor Marcy Segner. Is she with us this evening? I believe she was going to be on the call. Yeah. Yes, I am. Oh, there you are. Okay. And the other person I had on my list was Dickinson Public Testimony, um, Dennis. Um, Mimi? Yes, I'm here. All right. Um, we'll be back to all of you in just a few minutes. Thank you. All right. We will do a roll call to see who is able to visit the site. Um, Dennis? Yes. Jill? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dave? Yes. Jake? Yes. Sean? Yes. And I also visited the site. Um, we'll now have an overview by staff. Uh, the applicant purchased this property in 2000. It's a 5.13 acre riparian lot on Clearwater Lake. Uh, the road that serves is Basswood Road. That's a township road uh, that serves the tract. The portion of that road is located within the 100 year floodplain. Uh, the applicant is working with interested parties to divide the 5.13 acre tract into a proposed two lot plat, which would be called Sister Shores. Uh, the regulatory flood protection elevation for Clearwater Lake is 997.70. That's with the uh, NGVD 29 datum. So the required road elevation to access those properties is 995.70. The a survey shows that the road elevation is as low as 993.1 or 2.60 feet lower than uh, what the requirement is. Uh, estimated amount of materials required to raise the road uh, to meet the township specifications and the required road elevation would be 810 tons of class one material and 630 four tons of class five material. The property is in an R1 zoning district. Again, it's partially in floodplain within the shoreland overlay of Clearwater Lake, which is recreational development. That lake is on the impaired waters list for mercury and fish. Uh, there is no known sewage treatment system on the property. Linden Township, the DNR, Clearwater River Watershed District, the Clearwater Lake Property Owners Association and owners within 500 feet have been notified of the request. Uh, I did receive a letter from the township. I believe you, uh, the members have that in their packets. Uh, basically, uh, they're waiving their requirements for uh, the road specifications uh, for this section of Basswood Road. And then I did also received correspondence this morning and that was from a Kenneth Laney uh, and it was sent to 
Ms. Shermer and forwarded to me. It, it states that South Haven Fire and Rescue would have no problem responding to 1223 Basswood Road in South Haven, Minnesota. We do cover residences farther west on that same road. We have a rescue boat to respond if there is flooding. Also four wheel drive firefighting apparatuses. We have not had any problems with flooding on that road in the last 30 years that I have been with the department. Also in case of fire, this would be automatic mutual aid with Annandale Fire Department. And again, that's from Kenneth Laney. And I'm assuming he's with South Haven Fire and Rescue. And that is it for correspondence. All right, thank you. Um, we'll now have time for um, the applicant, um, the, the buyer's realtor, and um, the other interested party, um, Mr. Nimi, um, to um, have their comments. So we'll begin with Jennifer, if you can give us your comments. Sure, thank you. Um, so this was brought to our attention um, in the planning process. Um, for the division of the of the land. And I guess the number one concern or issue that I have and question is um so in the the basswood road is a it's like a quarter of a mile road that leads to a tar county road. In between those that county road and our property is a another house currently being built. And it was told to me, because um, I asked the question that if we are required to have to raise the road to the elevation all the way to the tar, how come the, the owners of this newly built house didn't have to do the same thing? And apparently, the answer was that it was just it was overlooked and um that they said i should go to those owners and discuss this situation to see if they would be willing to help pay to raise the road to the level and um in my opinion i think that is uh not an, an acceptable oh, answer to that. Okay. So um, Dennis has um, been with the township for many years, and I think he can speak on behalf of the road and any issues that that road has had in the past. Okay, we will we'll get down to his testimony in, in just a moment then. Um, Rhonda, did. The other buyer, um, do you have any comments you would like to make at this time? Um, I don't really believe that. Um, spoke to, um, I just think that we're looking at a, a township road that has well served many residences in the area. Um, I just don't see the need to have that substantial of a investment put into um, a road just to get a, a permit. Okay. Um, and then we'll move on to um, Marcy, the, um, your realtor. Um, did you have any comments? Um. I, you know, I, I think the only thing that I would say, I don't, I don't know if the cost was mentioned that it's around four, we've got an estimate of around $40,000. Um, that would be, it sounds like, the, you know, the burden of these buyers um, would have to take that on. So that's kind of the other com, com, uh, component of that. Okay. All right. And then uh, Mr. Nimi, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you are, ma'am. Okay, could you please um, give us your insights onto this? Okay, um, I've been a supervisor in Linden Township for, well, the first round was 92 until the year 2000. And uh, I was road supervisor 
all of those years. And now I am again, road supervisor. This is my third year. Uh, and uh, we have never, ever had any problems with that road, uh, ever had water come anywhere close to going over the top of the road. And so I really think that's a non-issue as far as flooding that road goes. Uh, the road is a good solid road. We accepted it in 1989 as part of Wilkins addition and have been maintaining it uh, uh, ever since then, every all winter and summer ever since then. And uh, I think this would be an uh, unnecessary burden on these uh, folks that want to buy those two end lots down there. Uh, it really is uh, completely unnecessary. Uh, it's not in a low area. It's a good sound road base. And uh, uh, the fire departments are okay with it. Uh, and as far as the Mr. Wilkins is the guy that's building the house right next to their uh, proposed development there. And uh, he did not have to assume any responsibility for that. So I don't really see where it would be uh, fair to have them pay uh, for the whole road to, to be lifted when it's not necessary. The township uh, is okay with them not lifting the road up. Uh, it's it's built to township specifications other than the elevation and so we really don't need to have it lifted so um the board uh we will honor the the decision of whatever the board decides but uh we would be in favor of the amendment or the uh, variance okay thank you um, do, um, the buyer, realtor, or, um, Mr. Nimi have any additional comments before we um, open it up to the board for questions? No. no okay. Okay. We're ready for, um, questions or conversation from the board. Um, I have one question for the, um, for Mr. Nimi, since you're very familiar with these roads, um, from where their access into their property will be where their driveway is mm -hmm. beyond that point um how many additional residences are there beyond that point um when you're coming from the main road uh the main road is birchwood that's also an asphalt coated uh township road and their property actually their their west property line is the township line uh fairhaven township is the next parcel on the lake and so all the rest of the residences are uh part of fairhaven township so uh we only deal up to the line with the road maintenance and the road acceptance i really don't know uh, a lot about the road past our property line there so okay um and I guess I just drove into where their property was and didn't keep driving on that road. Does that that road have an additional exit if you keep going on that road or is or does it dead end? I believe it dead ends. I'm not mistaken for sure. It dead ends. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, a uh, question for staff. Uh, there are some conditions, uh, number three and number four, uh, and, uh, you know, assuming we approve a variance here, uh, I'm just wondering if those are uh, options for us to consider, or are they considered mandatory conditions? Uh, you know, and then if they are mandatory, I have some more questions. All right, staff's comment on that? Um, if you're not speaking at the current time, if you could please um, mute your sound for us. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Member Gregory, uh, I, th I think number three, the condition number three that's recommended uh, may be satisfied with the letter that we reported this morning. Uh, the, uh, I think the department is satisfied with that as, as satisfying condition number three. Um, 
Number four, I may have to defer that that condition um, in terms of how you specify the period of use occupancy. Um, you know, in a specific time frame. Uh, I mean, this is what's in the ordinance, uh, but I, I think we may be able to, to discuss that further here in open forum. So uh, potentially, uh, Mr. Nett, uh, if we as a board said uh, that we're not going to limit the, the time uh, that they can use or occupy their structure in the case of a flood, uh, would that be an acceptable uh, condition uh, if we have to uh, address number four? Uh, Madam Chair, Member Gregory, I think um, it's 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 fairly open in terms of what kind of limitations you can place on occupancy. I, you know, in my opinion, it would be satisfactory if you would just uh, allude to the times of flooding that. Uh, there cannot be occupancy should should the property or the road flood. Uh, and again, I I think if we could discuss that further and be open to uh, what those time limits may be. Thank you. In regard to that, um, staff, if you could let me know, are there any types of conditions put on um, other property owners on that? At on that road as far as occupancy during a time of flooding or uh madam chair not that not that i'm aware of or even the department's aware of that there's any limitations of occupancy during flooding on on any of the other properties on that road Mad madam chair uh dennis gregory um if the board is in favor of this variance uh uh, the my thought is that we do not put a limitation uh, that we address it, but not put a limitation on use or occupancy. It's it sounds like we have that choice. Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn. Um, the thing is, is that these these are recommended conditions, certainly. And, and uh, Dennis brings up a good point, but uh, yes, I think if we brought it to a vote. We'd probably just get rid of three and four and only include two conditions on the request. Well, I believe the other two items were not necessarily conditions. Um, it, one was that, to grant or deny. True, true. And number two is what an alternative of if we don't um, offer the uh, variance and I would agree with the conversation that's been going on. My concern is to put a limitation or a requirement on one person that's living on or one or two people that are living on that road when no one else on that road would have that similar limitation and could be affected in the, the same way that these landowners would be affected. Right, and, I'm, and who's going to be the one who interprets or, or determines uh, the limitations and, and the flooding stage or not, and et cetera? I mean, maybe we should just scratch that whole, um, all four of those. The, the, Excuse me, Dennis. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I think uh, staff would be of the opinion that uh, if you're so inclined to uh, move forward and you would be granting that you, you know, if if condition recommended condition number three is satisfied with the written statement that uh, you could then interpret that the flood emergency response procedures are in place and, and therefore no further conditions would need to be uh, enforced. 
I, I would agree with that because um, you know they indicated in their letter that um, if necessary, um, they could have um, emergency services could be provided via the waterway, and um, so that that would cover our any concerns that are there for the safety of the residents. Yeah, and, and just by way of explanation, uh, Madam Chair, uh, it says the Board of Adjustment must. And so that's why I was asking the question versus could or may. And uh, and so, uh, but I, I think we have it cleared up now and uh, um, I would be uh, willing to make a motion to close the public hearing if, if you're so inclined to take that motion. I will take that motion. Is there someone that would like to second that? Madam Chair, Sean Blackburn, I'll second that motion. All right, we have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Is there anyone in opposition of closing the public hearing from the board? Hearing none, um, the public hearing is now closed. And we will look at um, findings of fact. Um, for the variance requested to develop a proposed two lot plot having vehicular access lower than the two feet below the regulatory flood protection elevation. Number one, the proposed use is allowed in the zoning district in which the subject property is located. Madam Madam Chair, Dennis. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, it's an R1 district. Uh, and having the uh, plant and houses is allowed and access to those is allowed. All right, we have a yes for number one. Is there any further discussion? Does anyone oppose yes for number one? Hearing none, we'll mark that as unanimous, yes. Number two, the variance will be in harmony with general purposes and intent of the official controls and any related ordinances, yes or no. Madam Chair, um, Jill DeLong, I believe that um, the the applicants have looked at or have asked for confirmation from the emergency folks. Um, they've asked for confirmation from their neighbors. Um, the general purposes are to ensure that emergency vehicles can access those homes and that the residents of the homes can um, leave and exit safely. And I believe that uh, with the testimony we've heard tonight, that that is true. So I believe that this is in harmony with general purposes. All right, we have a yes for number two. Any additional comments? Anyone opposed to yes? Hearing none, I'll mark that as unanimous yes. Number three, the variance will be consistent with the comprehensive plan, yes or no. Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, uh, connectivity goal number one is to develop and maintain a transportation system that promotes the safety, mobility, and access of all users. Uh, I would just echo member DeLong's comments uh, regarding each of those uh, items. All right, do we have any additional um, comments for number three? We have a yes. Um, is there anyone opposed to yes for three? Hearing none, we'll mark it as unanimous yes. Number four, the property owner proposes to use the property in a reasonable manner. Well, I will state that I believe it's a reasonable manner, especially, you know, after they we've heard testimony from the township saying that um, over the amount of history that he has been involved, which is considerable number of years, um, this road has not had any issues um, regarding its its um, height. Madam Chair, I'd like to just add to that that none of the other neighbors are required to comply with that as well. So everyone's using that same road. So it would be unfair to have two property owners pick up the burden of paying for a, a road that everyone else is using. All right, um, so we have a yes for number four. Anyone opposed to yes? Hearing none, I'll mark that as unanimous. Um, the plight of the landowner is due to circumstances unique to the property not created by the landowner. Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, the uh, uh, 
the circumstances unique to the property is that it's located near and in a, a floodplain, a hundred year floodplain. Um, and, uh, and, and which uh, by its very nature is only going to happen once every hundred years. Okay. And, um, any other conversation on that 1? We have a yes. Does anyone disagree with yes for number 5? I will mark that as a unanimous. Yes. Number 6, the variance if granted maintains the essential character of the locality. Madam chair, Dave Gamrod, uh, it won't change anything because this road has been in existence and used for many years. And if there is a problem in the road, it'll be everyone's uh, problem with taxes to, to repair it. Okay. Um, any additional conversation for number six? We have a yes. Does anyone disagree with yes? Hearing none, I'll mark that as unanimous. Number seven, the need for the variance involves more than economic considerations. I think there, uh, Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, I think there are other uh, conditions uh, that the applicant is worried about besides economics. Certainly economics is one issue, uh, but there are other issues such as the reasonable use of their property, uh, and as member Hain uh, pointed out, uh, the fair distribution of those economics. Okay, we have um, a yes for number seven. Are there any um, additional comments? Is anyone opposed to yes for number seven? Hearing none, we'll mark that as unanimous yes. We are now ready for a motion. Madam Chair, Dennis Gregory, I would make a motion to approve uh, applicants request for a variance uh, to develop a proposed two lot plat having vehicular, vehicular access lower than two feet uh, below the regulatory flood protection elevation. And since they were recommended, would you want to just add a comment saying with no sure. conditions? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so no limitations uh, for use or occupancy during a time of flooding. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, do we have a second for the motion? Madam Chair, Mike Hain, I'm second that. All right. We have a motion and a second. We'll do roll call. Um, Jill. Yes. Dave. Yes. Jake. Yes. Sean. Yes. And I also am a yes. Um, motion passes. Um, if you have any additional questions um, about um, moving forward with this, um, you can talk with um, environmental services staff via the telephone during regular business hours. Um, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. And um, question for staff, are there any other items that you would like us to discuss this evening? I'm seeing their heads shaking no. So we will um, take a motion to adjourn. Madam Chair. Yes. We have not approved minutes lately. Um, well, I will inquire that of staff. Um, as far as when minutes will minutes be available for the last few meetings. At the regular December meeting. Yeah, Madam Chair. I I don't believe they're ready at this point, but yeah, uh, hopefully for the scheduled meeting. All right, and the, I think that would be minutes probably for the next several months. Yeah, so if yeah. you could verify that for the December meeting. Thank you for raising that question. Yeah. Um, any other comments from board members before we adjourn? Then if we could have a motion to adjourn. So move. Okay, we have a motion by Mike to adjourn. Is there a second? Dave Gamera, I'll second. All right, and um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. And thank you, and we will see you next uh, in two weeks. Two weeks. Okay, good night, so good good night everyone. Uh, good night. Thanks, everybody.